Okay, we are back. Right, so I've got 50 minutes to talk about the rest of the changes in Java since JDK 12. So this is part two of the presentation that started before the break. And as you'll remember, we were talking about JDK 14, and we talked about records, and we talked about pattern matching, for instance, of... Now we'll start by talking about some of the things that have changed in terms of some of the APIs. So there is this thing called the Foreign Memory Access API. And the idea behind this is to give you the ability to access memory that is not on heap. In Java, obviously, we have the idea of implicit versus explicit pointers. Unlike in C and C++, where a pointer really is a number, and it refers to an address in memory, even though it's virtual memory. And you can manipulate that mathematically in Java, we have implicit pointers, so we have references to objects and we don't know where they actually are. We just use that to say, I want to access this object, and the JVM does it for us. But there are definitely situations where, for certain types of applications, it is useful to be able to access memory outside of the heap. And, you know, if you want to write an application where you're doing sort of memory that's shared between multiple processes, that's a good example, then having access to virtual memory directly and being able to have shared memory across po multiple processes is, is useful. So the way that that's been possible in the past is through good old Sun, Misc, Unsafe. Um, you know, there have been some other APIs around that. Again, just as a show of hands, has anybody here used Sun, Misc, Unsafe in any of their code? One person, okay. That's good, that's good. I mean, I know that there are a few people out there who use it, but you know, it's, it's, it's not really recommended. So what they've done is they've actually come up with the idea of, okay, if people really want to use memory outside of the heap, let's give them a proper way of doing it with a supported API that has all the things they need. So that's what the Foreign Memory Access API is all about. Safe and efficient way to access memory. And really you can think of it in terms of three main parts. So there is a memory segment, and what that does is model a contiguous area of memory on your machine. So you can think of it as a block of memory. Then you have the idea of a memory address, which models, if you like, a pointer. So it points to a memory address somewhere, maybe in the block of memory, maybe on the heap. And then you've got the idea of a memory layout, which is how you can define a programmatic description of a memory segment in terms of what things is it actually holding. And by doing that, it gives you the ability to interact with it in a simpler way. You don't have to do as much of the mathematics of figuring out the individual addresses that you want to reference. So a very simple example of that is that we want to allocate some space to use. And for those of you who've done like C programming, this is kind of like malloc. So we're saying, OK, I want a space that's at least 100 bytes in size. So I say memory segment, allocate native 100 bytes of memory. That gives me a reference to it. And then what I want to do is I want to be able to use that and put things in it. So what I can do is I can use memory access as a, another class there. And I can do set int at offset. Very logically, I'm going to put an integer value at a particular offset into that area of memory. And as a programmer, I'm responsible for figuring out that a integer, an integer, in this case, is four bytes long. So we need to increment by four bytes every time we want to store a value there. That's the simplest way we can do it. Now, what we can also do is combine that with var handles, which have been in Java for a while now, so that we can get simpler access to more structured data. And the example I've got here, what we can do is we can create a sequence layout. So this is the idea of our, our memory layout again. And what we want to be able to do is to simply have a sequence of values that we want to store into an area of memory. So our sequence layout that we're going to create is for an int array. And we use memory layout. We say that we want something of sequence. And we're going to have 25 of them. And then the memory layout is going to have 32 bits for each of these things, so the integer that we want to be able to store. And we're going to use the byte order 
which is native to the platform, meaning that we don't care whether it's least significant bit first or most significant bit first, just use whatever is appropriate for the platform we're on. If we wanted to, we could force it one way or the other by using a different byte order, but in this case, we're simply saying 25 32-bit wide values and use the underlying ordering for those bits. What we then do is create a var handle, and in this case, we're going to use our int array layout to return a var handle to that, and we're going to say that we want store ints in there, and we're going to use the, the sequence for that. Then what we can do in terms of creating a memory segment, same as we did before, is we'll allocate space for that. We'll allocate as much space as, as required for our int array layout. So we don't have to calculate that. The underlying system will figure out how much that is. And then we loop through and we say, OK, we want to add an int element to that. And we'll do that simply by index element handle, set the value at a particular place, and off it goes. So it's really just like using pointers, but with a lot more code. <laughs> That's really what it is. There's a lot more method calls, but it's essentially giving you the access to the underlying memory, and you can do it through this particular method. Another thing in JDK 14, and I think this is probably my favorite feature in JDK 14, is the helpful null pointer exception. So, quick show of hands, who has never had a null pointer exception in their code? Be honest. Right. Everybody has had a null pointer at some point. Now, that's fine because, you know, we, we do things wrong and we, we catch those and we look at what we've done. The problem comes when we do something like this, where we're chaining together references and we say a.b.c.i equals 99. All well and good, except when we get a null pointer exception. And we'll see something like this. And it'll say exception in thread main, null pointer exception at line 5. Great. So now I know it's line 5, so I know it's that line of code. The problem is... Is it that A is null, so I can't reference B? Is it B that's null, so I can't reference C? Is it C that's null, so I can't reference I? Then I have to you know, fire up the debugger, I have to put breakpoints in, I have to look at things, or I have to put print statements in. It's all just a lot more effort than it really needs to be. So in JDK 14, we finally get this. Exception in thread main, Java lang, null pointer exception, cannot read field C because A dot B is null. Now, immediately I know where the problem is. I can go and look at it and figure out where did I not set A dot B. Great, solves the problem. There's only one downside to this, which is you have to enable it. Why? I, I guess that there's probably some logic which says that people are parsing the error messages and that might cause backward compatibility issues. But really, I mean, come on, just turn it on by default and then let people turn it off if they really need to parse the error messages. Uh, to turn it on, you need to use this catchy little command line flag, which is minus xx plus show code details in exception messages. Couldn't really make that much longer, could they? Well, they probably could, but anyway. It could have been shorter. Right. Uh, another thing in JDK 14 was bringing the packaging tool back. And I say bringing it back because back in JDK 11 and earlier, we had JavaFX included in the Oracle JDK. And part of JavaFX was a tool that allowed you to package desktop applications. So you could create an installable package that you could provide to somebody and they could install it on their machine. What they've done in JDK 14 is bring that back outside of JavaFX, so that if you do want to package an application, then you can do that using this. And it extends it further, not just um, desktop applications. It can apply to other applications as well. Essentially, it builds on a set of other tools. It builds on things like JLink, which you can use to build a runtime which is specific to your application. You can strip out all of the modules from the JDK that you don't need. You can minimize the size of the runtime, remove the manual pages and things like that if you don't want them. And then there's lots of other things in terms of the packaging tools on the platform that you want to create it for. So if you're running on Linux, for example, you can use RPM on Mac, you can use things like PKG and stuff like that. From a use point of view, there's lots of options you can specify on the command line. Here's just a sort of example. So you've got JPackage, you give it a name, you can give it a version, even give it things like a license file and who created it, uh, the type of thing, icon if you want to, so you've got the thing on the desktop. Um, the main jar file, all that kind of stuff, and then you know Linux shortcut if you're using Linux, 
um, Linux group that you want to put it on the desktop and stuff like that. So it's, it's a useful thing if you're creating applications and you want to be able to deploy them and give them to people to, to install on the machine. Okay, moving on to JDK 15. What did we get there? Right, well, let's talk a little bit about Java inheritance. Java is an object-oriented language, and so we have the idea of superclasses and subclasses, a type hierarchy. The thing that we have is the ability to define a type hierarchy like this. We can say that shape is a superclass, and then we've got triangle, square, and pentagon as subclasses. That's all good. The problem that we face is that we don't have any real restriction on controlling who can subclass a given class. The only thing we can do is to mark it as final and say nobody can subclass it. So that's all or nothing. So it's either everybody can subclass it or nobody can subclass it. Okay. And what we've done in JDK 15 is introduce the idea of sealed classes. Again, it's a preview feature initially. And what those allow you to do is exactly what you want to do, which is control the access over who can subclass a specific class. And you can think of final as being the ultimate sealed class, because nobody can extend it. Interesting thing about this is when I looked at this, I thought to myself, why do they call it sealed classes? Because it also applies to interfaces. And I thought, wouldn't you really want to call it sealed types? Wouldn't that be a better name for it? And I tweeted about that, and uh, I think it was uh, one of the Java engineers replied to me. And he said, oh, it's actually because classes and interfaces are, well, interfaces are actually just a special form of class. So I learned something new there. I didn't realize that interfaces are actually a special form of class, but apparently they are. So they decided to call it sealed classes rather than sealed types. Okay, I digress. In terms of how this works is there are several new contextual keywords. And that in itself is, is quite important because in Java we have the idea of keywords, reserved words. So things like class is a reserved word and things like for, F-O-R, is a reserved word and so on. But as we add new features, we need to be careful about how we add new reserved words because anything that's a reserved word can't be used as a variable name. And if you look back to like JDK 1.4, with the introduction of assertions, assert became a reserved word, which meant you couldn't use assert as a variable name. Potentially broke backwards code. JDK 5, we introduced enumerations, which meant that enum couldn't be used as a variable name. I remember at the time thinking to myself, well, yeah, nobody would use enum as a variable name, would they? So that's not going to affect many people. Then I compiled some of my code and found that I had used enum as a variable name. So, okay, that didn't really work. But we need to be careful about that. And so what they do now is they use contextual keywords, meaning that the compiler will only treat them as keywords in certain situations. We already saw that with record. So record is a contextual keyword, meaning that you don't have to worry about not being able to use record as the name of your, your variable. So now we have um, contextual keywords, which replaces what used to be restricted identifiers and keywords. There are three of those for sealed classes, which is sealed, permits, and non-sealed. Now, that in itself is a big deal, because we've never had a hyphenated keyword in Java before. And you can't believe the amount of discussion that went on on the mailing list about whether we should have hyphenated keywords. But the reality is that if we want to extend the language a lot further, using hyphenated keywords is definitely a good idea, because it really gets away from backwards compatibility because you can't use a hyphen in a variable name anyway, so it's not an issue. In sealed classes, all of the classes involved must be either in the same package or in the same module, so they have to be reasonably close in terms of where they're defined. How this works, if we take our example of shape, triangle, square, and pentagon, what we can now do is we can define our class shape and we can add an additional modifier saying that this is a sealed class. So we get public sealed class shape, and then we add a permits clause which lists out the classes which are permitted to subclass it. In this case, triangle, square, and pentagon. That's all good. So now the code will compile, we can subclass, we can create our classes and so on. If somebody comes along and says, mm, I like that shape class, I want to create a subclass of that called circle, 
Because it's not in the permits clause, the compiler will look at that and go, mm, nope, can't do that. And it will give you an error, meaning that you won't be able to compile your code. This is, this is good, you see, because the, the real kind of reasoning behind this is that you have a set of classes that you've defined and you've, you've control that in the way that you want to design them. Somebody comes along and says, oh, actually, I like shape, I'm going to use that. They use it somewhere else, you possibly don't know about it. You then decide to make some changes to your shape class, very logical, you know, it works with your type hierarchy, but the person who's then decided to subclass it elsewhere suddenly runs into problems because the behavior's changed and they don't know about that and things don't work in the way they expect them to. So by doing this, it controls things, keeps things nice and tidy. Now, one of the things about sealed classes is all of the subclasses of a sealed class, class must define explicitly their inheritance capabilities. There are three ways of doing that. First of those is that you can continue to have a sealed class. In the case of our triangle, we can say that we modify that as a sealed class, so we have sealed class triangle, and we can then permit some further subclasses, equilateral isosceles. So it continues that ceiling, but with further subclasses. The second thing we can do is we could prevent any further subclassing. The same way that we can do already, we can simply make that a final class, and nobody can then subclass it. Square is final. The third one, which is sort of the, you know, the new thing, we're using this hyphenated keyword, is to unseal it and say, okay, we've got class Pentagon, but we don't want to restrict that in any way. We don't want to make it final. We don't want to specify it as being sealed. Anybody can now inherit from Pentagon. To do that, we modify the class definition and we say non-sealed class Pentagon extend shape. So it has to be one of those three things. You can't just create a class um, without specifying one or the other. Records. Introduced in JDK 14, now in a second preview in JDK 15. A couple of small changes here. Um, one thing is that the fields of the record are now truly, really final. You might think they're final because you know, they get marked as final in the code that's generated, but final values in Java are not really final because if you use reflection, you can still change a final variable after it's been set, which is not really the way you want it to work. So in records now, the JVM enforces that final quality of the variables, and if you try and change it with reflection, you'll actually get an illegal access exception thrown. So they really are final. Second thing they did was to prohibit native methods from being used in records. You can add extra methods to your record. Can't use native methods and JNI with that because the idea being that they could introduce behavior that would be dependent on external state. And that was just their reasoning behind that. The other thing they did with records in the second preview, which I, I really like, is the introduction of local records. A um, bit like a local class. These are implicitly static. And it also now means that this applies to both enumerations and interfaces. I think this is, is a really good change in terms of what they've done. What it allows us to do is to simplify code by using a local record. Good example here, I've created a method which is designed to find the top sellers from a list in a given month. I create a local record which is called sales and that has in it a seller and a double which is the amount that they sold. Okay, so nice simple tuple. Then when I come to actually process my list of sellers, I can use a stream I can then pass that to map, which will map it from the sellers into a stream of records of sales. And I create that the, each record by populating it with the seller from the input stream and then call a method to figure out how much they sold in the given month that I'm interested in and use that as the second value for the record. So now I've got a stream of records that has both the seller and how much they sold in the month I'm interested in. I pass that into sorted, do a double compare on the amount that they sold, so that my stream now becomes an ordered stream based on how much they sold, high to low. So the best seller is at the front, worst seller is at the back. Then I can pass that through map again and take my record 
extract out the seller from that, so I've gone back to my stream of sellers, but it's ordered based on how much they sold, simply collect that into a list, and I've got my list ordered by how much they sold. By using a local record, it just makes the code simpler, rather than having to do more complex things in terms of um, how the stream would work. So this is a really nice change to the way that records work. The other thing is that they made sure that they would work with sealed classes from the point of view of interfaces, so sealed interfaces really here. If I define a sealed interface, in this case called car, which permits two sub-interfaces, red car and blue car, then if I want to create some records, then I can do that with record red car implements car, record blue car implements car, and that will all work quite happily. So records work with sealed interfaces. JDK 16. Pattern matching instance of, okay? So we talked about that previously. That was a preview feature. That has now become a final feature in JDK 16. Same thing with records. So records became final feature. No more changes um, were required. Well, not in the case of records. Um, but in the case of pattern matching instance of, they made two minor changes before they made them a final feature. First was that the pattern variables are no longer explicitly final. I think this is also a sensible decision because if you want to change that variable, then you know, there might well be a situation where you do want to change it. But in the past, the way that it worked was that when you had your instance of and the pattern matching, the variable that was created, the pattern variable, was going to be implicitly final. That's now no longer the case, so you can make changes to it if you want to. The other thing they said was it's now a compile time error to compare an expression of type S against a pattern of type T where S is a subtype of T. Okay, you need to read that a couple of times to figure out what it actually means, but it's probably easier just to give you an example. So if I have a method called print color point and I pass in a rectangle to that, and then within the body I say if R instance of rectangle and then give it a variable name rect, then I'm going to print out rect. Well, that's really kind of redundant, isn't it? Because if I'm looking at R being an instance of rectangle, I pass the rectangle in. So it's got to be a rectangle. It's a completely redundant if statement. And now, if you try and do that, you will actually get an error from the compiler, and it will say rectangle is a subtype expression of type rectangle. Um, indeed, it is. So it won't let you do it. And obviously, that also applies to um, type hierarchies as well. Streams map multi. So this is similar to flat map. <laughs> and interestingly, when you read the sort of base description, each element on the input stream is mapped to zero or more elements on the output stream. It sounds an awful lot like flat map. I'm, I must admit, when I first looked at this, I thought, what is the difference between this and flat map? Because flat map is the idea that you take an element on your input stream, generate multiple elements, and put those onto the output stream. So how is this different? The difference is that you can apply a mapping at the same time. So it's, it's um, the way that it works. And it uses a by consumer for that. So again, we'll look at an example. Simplest form is in terms of a map multi where you're going from one to either zero or one on the output. What I do here is I take a stream of strings, which are the names of programming languages, pass that into map multi, and in this case, remember, I'm using a bind consumer, which takes two inputs and consumes both of those. So um, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm passing in the, the value of the stream, and then I've got a consumer, which is what I'm going to use to actually do something with the, the values. In this case, my lambda expression, I'm going to say if the length of the string on the input stream is greater than four, then I accept using the consumer with the string length as being, or with the string length. So that gets put onto the output stream. And then I use for each and I simply print out what is the value of that. If I run that, what I'm going to see is that there are two strings in there which have length greater than four, which is Python and JavaScript, so six and 10. Now, that's really nice, except you could just do it with filter. So don't bother doing this. This is, this is just like m more code than you need to use to do a simple filter. The second is a one-to-one -one mapping. 
where you can say, OK, let's take our stream of names again, and we'll pass that into map multi. Again, we've got our stream of input values, and we've got our consumer. And all we're going to do is we're going to consume the length of that stream by doing that mapping. And then we'll print it out. Again, don't bother doing this, because that's exactly the same as just doing a map. So there is one useful situation where you can use map multi, which is one too many. So that's what it's really designed for. So in this case, what we're doing is we're taking our stream of words, passing it to map multi. Again, we've got the stream and the consumer. And this time, we're going to say that for each of those words, we're going to print the number of letters in that word that number of times. So we'll print four, four times, we'll print two, two times, and so on. In order to do that, the, the important bit about this is that we can call the accept method on the consumer as many times as we want. So we don't have to call it just once. We can call it as many times as we like, and we can add things to the consumer, and those will go onto the output stream, and then we can process those on the next part of our stream. So it's, again, it's a small change to the streamers interface, gives us a little bit of extra functionality, um, it's a simple, simpler way of doing certain things, but obviously not everything that we would want to use that for. Stream to list, another change to the streams API. Um, essentially, this is just a simplified terminal operation that avoids an explicit use of collect. Because if you look at the way that we use streams a lot, we tend to end up, not always, but a lot of the time we collect things into a list. So we could do something like this. Of course, we never would. I mean, this, this is a little bit of a silly example, but we can do stream.of123, create a stream of those things. Then we do collect, collectors.toList, and that will use the terminal operation collect, and then we'll do collectors.toList as the collector from the collector's utility class to generate a list from that. Now, in JDK 15, it just becomes a little bit simpler because we don't have to call collect with the collector. We just say to list, and there's a new terminal operation that does that for us, generates the list. So very simple change, but quite useful. Period of day. Another small change to the API that's, you know, it's got some use. If we look at the time of day, we can say it's either morning or afternoon or evening. So it's either AM or PM. With period of day, we now have a more descriptive way of describing where we are in the day. So if we run JShell, we could do something like this. We could do date time formatter of pattern, and there's a new pattern to use, which is the capital letter B. Obviously, they're running out of letters because B has nothing to do with period of day, but they obviously had to use something. And then if you've passed that format dot local time now, and you run it, well, now, what you would see is in the afternoon. If you ran it earlier, you'd see in the morning. Run it later, you'll see in the evening, at night. So it gives you a more descriptive thing about what time of day it is. The vector API. OK, first thing is this is not to be confused with the vector class. Vector class, very old. It's the collection that we used to use way back, and all the methods are synchronized, so it's not really a very good idea. Use ArrayList instead. The vector API is different. So the vector API is a way of allowing you as a programmer to express how you want vector computations to happen. Because if you look at modern hardware, modern hardware has the ability to use single instruction, multiple data. Very wide registers, also called vector operations. And this is a very good way of improving the performance of numerically intensive operations. So this we could use using an API. Ideally, this wouldn't be necessary. And the reason I say that is because if the compiler was smart enough, the JIT compiler, it could look at the code and go, you know what, I can actually use vector operations for this and convert it into the appropriate set of vector instructions. But the problem is that most JIT compilers are not as smart as they need to be. Now, I will say that some of the work that we've been doing at Azul um, with our prime JVM, we use a different JIT compiler to Hotspot called Falcon, which is based on LLVM. And that does a much better job of identifying where vector operations can be used. So you don't need to use this API so much with our JVM. Just a little bit of a plug there for our product. 
So how this works is that if I've got a set of values that I want to do something to, so integer values, and I want to apply the same operation to all of them, if I wanted to add two to each of those values, typically what I have to do is I have to go through that one at a time. So I have a loop and I say, okay, add two to 10 becomes 12, add two to 14, 16, add two to 11, 13, add two to eight, 10. Okay, so I have to do that in a loop and I have to do it four times. That's not too bad with four elements, but if you've got millions of elements, obviously it becomes very tedious and takes a long time. So the idea of vector operations is very wide register and you populate the very wide register with elements from your array and you pack it out so that you've got a number of values in that single register. Then what you can do is you can say to the processor, apply an operation to all the values in that register at the same time in a single clock cycle. So rather than it taking you four clock cycles, you take one clock cycle, the processor can add two to each of those numbers. It knows the, the way that it's laid out. It can add two to each of them. Single clock cycle takes you a quarter of the time that it does to do it in a loop. So that's, that's the theory. Now let's look at an example. Here is a very simple piece of code. So we want to add some arrays if the element in the second array is even. And that's the important thing, because if we didn't have a conditional in here, and we were just saying, OK, add two elements in an array together, pretty much any compiler would recognize it and say, yep, yeah, we'll use vector operations for that. Introducing a conditional makes it much harder for the compiler to see that, and so typically won't do that. In this case, if we look at the code that's generated without the vector API, so if you take Hotspot and you compile that, don't worry about all the instructions that you're seeing here, but essentially the red boxes are showing you what's happening. What's happening in terms of the optimization is that the compiler is saying, okay, well, we'll do each of those elements individually, but to get some improvement, we'll do loop unrolling. And that's a common technique where rather than doing every iteration, you do every other iteration, and you do two elements within each of those iterations. So we're seeing a tiny improvement performance, but it's not using vector operations. What we can then do is make the code a little bit more complicated. So there is more work for us to do, but it then allows us to make use of vector operations underneath. First thing we need to do in our method is to create a species for the vector. And the reason we do that is because we need to know what we're using in terms of both the size of the register and also what things we're going to put in there. So in this case, we're going to use a 256-bit wide register, which would be AVX2 instructions in Intel processor speak. And we're going to put int values in there, so our 32-bit wide values. Then we go through our loop in the same way, so we loop through, but this time, rather than incrementing by each element, we increment by the length of the species, because we're going to load up the register with all of the elements, and then do it as a single clock cycle. So within that, the first thing we need to do is create a mask, and the mask allows the vector operations and the vector API to identify which set of bits we're going to put the, the values into. So we, we use a 32-bit mask in this case, and, and we index by the, um, where we are within the register. Then for each of our arrays, we need to create a vector of that. So we create a vector as integers from the array that we've been passed, so A, and we use our mask to do that because we know we're masking for integers. We do the same thing for B, so we create the um, int vector from the array using B this time rather than A, same thing. And then what we can do is we can create the values that we want as the results, which is to say vector A, and then we specify what we want to do, which is add vector B. Then we need to take the value out of vector C and put it into, back into the uh, vector A array. So it's, it's kind of like doing that. But it essentially means that we're doing multiple elements in a single clock cycle. If we look at the code that's generated from that, it looks very different, may look more complicated. But what we're actually seeing now here is both loop unrolling and the use of vector operations. So we're getting a sort of basically a four to one improvement over what we had before. And as I say, if you're doing you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of, of values, 
then this will have a significant performance improvement for you. Foreign linker API, another API that was introduced in um, JDK 15. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 15. Um, so this is um, essentially another incubator API. Um, what this is about doing is sort of working in conjunction with the foreign memory access API. This is part of a bigger project called Panama, which is a replacement for JNI. So if you want to interact with native code, you need the ability to interact with native memory, but you also need the ability to interact with native libraries. In the past, JNI, if you've ever used JNI, can be very fiddly, it can be very complicated. Um, I know I've used JNI a fair amount, and I, I do find you know, getting the right libraries and the right linking and everything and generating header files is all fiddly. I do remember talking to one of the people who actually um, worked on the original JNI, and I said to him, it's, it's really fiddly to use this. And he said, yes, we designed it that way. And you think, I'm not sure that's the right design approach to take, is to make it difficult to use from the outset. But anyway, the idea behind Project Panama is to make that much simpler. And when Project Panama actually gets it fully into the JDK, things will be really good because they have this thing called the jextract command, which is not yet in OpenJDK. But a lot of the code that you see here will just disappear. And you'll run jextract, there'll be some import statements, and then off you go. But as an example, if we wanted to call the um, get PID system call on our operating system to find out what process ID we have, we could do it this way. So the first thing we need to do is to get a reference to the linker itself. So this will enable us to interact with a native library. So we can do that through a factory method on the CLink class. We then need to be able to look up the particular function that we want to call, in this case, get lib, uh, get pid. So we do that by, again, getting a library lookup, and we need to tell the library lookup where to look for that function. By using of default, it's going to enable us to find all of the functions that are accessible to the JVM itself. So any system calls that it can access underneath. If you had another library, you could specify that through a different lookup reference, and you could get uh, your library through there. Once you've done that, you need to get a method handle to your getPid function. And you do that by calling the linker, and you generate a down call handle. Down call handle is the idea that you're calling down to get PID. There's also an up call, which is essentially a, like a callback. So if you want your native code to call into Java methods, then you use an up call handle. Down call handle is where you're calling a native function from Java. So we create a down call handle. We look up the get PID function and get a, a reference to that from that. Then we need to tell it the types that are involved. So we're going to say that the type that we need is, uh, is an integer, and that's on both sides. So it's an integer from the Java point of view that we're going to use, and it's also a C integer that's going to be returned as the process ID. So having done that, we can then just invo invoke on the get PID reference, invoke exact, and we'll get back the process ID, and we can print it out. As I say, with jextract, all of the code above the system.out.print line disappears. We just get an import statement, and it's so much simpler. Warnings for value-based classes. Um, this is part of Project Valhalla, um, and it adds uh, some of the things around that, because Project Valhalla is the idea of value types in Java. And one of the things that they need to do is uh, one of the things they're doing with this is sort of introducing the idea of primitives being treated as classes. So if you want to store ints into an array list, for example, you don't need to use the wrapper class integer and then go through the whole boxing and unboxing type of thing. So the idea of Valhalla is to do some of that. As part of that work, what they've done here is they've actually said that the primitive wrapper classes, so integer float and so on, um, they've designated these as value-based so that when they do finally get Valhalla integrated into the JDK. In JDK 9, they deprecated the constructors on these classes. You know, never really were supposed to be using them, but they deprecated them anyway. They're now marked as for removal, and that means that at some point, probably next JDK, they will actually disappear. 
And then uh, also if you attempt to synchronize on an instance of a value-based class, so a primitive wrap class, that will issue you with a warning. So th this is really kind of some of the groundwork for Valhalla. On to JDK 17, final one. Pattern matching for switch, okay. So we see pattern matching for instance of. Now they've introduced the idea of pattern matching for switch statement and switch expression. Reason for that is that if you look at the way that switch works, you're limited in what types you can actually switch on. So you can use integral values, you can use strings, and you can use enumerations. But everything else you can't use with switch. This is now expanded so that you can use type patterns on the match. So it's similar to the way that we see instance of. So here's an example. So we've got a method called type tester, we pass in an object, so we don't know what type it is specifically, and then we can switch on O, and then we can have cases where we can use pattern matching. So the first one doesn't quite use pattern matching because it's a null, but we have to be able to identify that. So we have case null, and then print out it's a null type. Then we can have case string and have the pattern variable, so S, so we're identifying that it is a string, and then we know that we're going to assign value uh, to S, so that um, when we want to, we can refer to S in the right-hand side of our arrow, and we can print out what the value of S is. Same with color. If it's a color, we'll assign the value to C, and then we can use that with the right-hand side of our code. And we can also do that with primitives as well. So we, well, not primitives, primitive arrays, I should say, because arrays are still a type. So we can use primitive arrays, and we can print out the values of that. And if we need to, if we've got a default, then that's OK. Completeness is important. So if I were to do this, I pass in an object, and I switch on O, but I only list out string S and integer I. That will not compile. The compiler will tell me that that is a not, not a complete list of possible types that could be passed through object. If I wanted to, you know, I could try and do that, but obviously there's no way of providing a complete list because it, it would be any type that you could possibly deal with. So in order for that to compile, I must include a default statement on that. So as long as I've got a default, that covers anything that's not a string or an integer, so the code will compile. Now, in terms of completeness, that can also work with our sealed classes. So we could do something like this. If we use the previous example we had in our sealed class, we can switch on a shape. And remember, shape is sealed and only has three possible subclasses. So as so long as we list all of those as cases, triangle T, square S, pentagon P, then we don't need a default because there is no default. So we've listed all the possibilities, and so it is a complete set of types, and that will compile, and the compiler will be quite happy with it. Guarded patterns, this is, this is quite a nice thing because it kind of takes it to the next step and shows you how you, know, you can do really interesting things with this. So what you can now do is you can, in the same way we saw with instance of, you can use that and, and operator. You can do the same thing with the switch with pattern matching. Again, use our shape as an example. So we switch on shape, and this time, the first case we're going to have will use the type pattern of triangle T, but we'll add a conditional and expression to that to say that it has to be triangle T, but also we can use T, call area on that, and see if it's greater than 25. And if both of those conditions are met, then we'll print out it's a big triangle. If both of those conditions aren't met, then we drop down to the next one, and we still test to see whether it's a triangle. If it is a triangle, then we know that it didn't pass the is it greater than 25 in area, so we can say it's a small triangle because it's less than 25. And then obviously we can do the same, we can do square and pentagon. But it's the idea that you can have a guarded pattern which allows you to have that primary pattern for the type as well as a conditional and expression. Compatibility issues. So a few things that we need to talk about here, because if you're moving from JDK 11 to JDK 17, lots of new stuff has been added. That's really good. But since JDK 9, I think it was, yes, 9, they've actually started removing things as well. So let's you know, look at things that have been removed. JDK 14, the CMS garbage collector got removed. Shouldn't really have been using that anymore. 
G1 was the replacement for that, so that should have been what you were using anyway. If you want really good garbage collection, again, I'm going to plug our product. So Azul Prime has C4 in it, truly pauseless garbage collector, great. JDK 15, they removed the NAS Horn scripting engine, JavaScript from Java. Anybody ever use NAS Horn? Oh, we've got a couple of people. Yeah. Never, never found a real use for JavaScript from Java. Anyway, um, JDK 17, they removed the experimental ahead of time and JIT compilers. This was sort of some of the stuff they brought in from Graal. So the Graal JIT compiler that was written in Java and the ahead of time compiler for generating native images. But really, all that work is going on in, in the Graal project. And they decided that it hadn't really picked up any sort of use, so they decided to abandon that. They've removed it. And then in JDK 17, they've also deprecated, so they haven't removed it yet, they've deprecated the security manager for removal. And again, this is one of those ones that people go, oh my goodness, we're removing the security manager. Is Java going to become insecure? And the answer is no, it's not. Um, the security manager is all about um, way, way back in JDK 1.0 and applets and the sandbox which applets would go in and being able to grant permission for things um, every time you wanted to access a resource. So they've decided that they want to do away with that. Um, some people are a little bit unhappy about it, um, but I think there's no way that that's ever going to be kept, so it is going away. The other thing that's, that's worth mentioning as well is internal JDK APIs. This was a big thing back in JDK 9 because what Oracle wanted to do and the JDK developers wanted to do was to encapsulate all of the internal APIs, including some misc unsafe. Now, they decided in JDK 9 they couldn't possibly do that because it would break too much backward compatibility. So they introduced this wonderfully named illegal access flag, which had a default value of permit, so that you could still reference the internal APIs, and that was all good. Now, in JDK 16, they changed the default value of that to deny, meaning that when you started running some of your applications, you would stop being able to access some of the internal APIs. You could still turn it back on by changing the value of the flag explicitly, and they would still work. In JDK 17, they've completed strong encapsulation almost. So why is almost, I say that the illegal access flag now has no effect because all of the internal APIs, except for the critical ones, of which there are eight, including some misc unsafe, are still accessible. But everything else inside the JDK itself is no longer accessible. Just to summarize then, I have two and a half minutes. Great. So I am going to plug our product. So one slide on here, which is what we do in terms of our distribution of the builds of OpenJDK. We have both a free version, so you can use it for free, and we also have a commercially supported version. Basically, it's a distribution of OpenJDK, fully TCK tested, uh, where possible. Um, the reason I say where possible is because JDK 6, we can no longer test that because Oracle don't support that themselves anymore, so the um, TCK is no longer valid for that. Everything else, 7, 8, 11, 13, 15, we support and can provide updates to. Wide platform support, so we've got 64-bit versions for Windows, Mac, and Linux, 32-bit versions for Windows and Linux, because some people are still using Windows XP. Um, and it is a real drop-in replacement for the Oracle JDK, because it's TCK tested, you don't have to change any code, you don't have to recompile, it all just works. That's my end of my marketing slide. Um, just to conclude then, I think the six-month release cycle is working really well. The fact that we've seen so many new features added in a very... A sort of stable way, gradually adding things. The idea of an, um, incubator modules and preview features, I think, is very, very powerful, and we're seeing the platform evolve in a, a really good way. Um, there are some things that I wasn't able to cover in this talk because I just didn't have time. Most of it's around things at the JVM level, so not really applicable mostly to developers. Um, there's stuff like um, hidden classes, which are not like sealed classes, but hidden classes. Um, and so, as I say, if, if you're looking for a distribution of OpenJDK, then have a look at our Zulu builds from Azul. And so, if anybody's got any questions, I've got 42 seconds. Oh, question over there. 
Yeah, I mean, so the question is about the control over native memory. Um, yes, I mean, it, it's, not as, it's not as good as if you're writing C code and having the access to memory and, and being able to use shared memory, for example. Um, so there are limitations on what you can do with it, but it's the idea of, of giving you more control over memory outside of the heap rather than you know, introducing the full um, way of doing things as you would have in C and C++. Yes, yeah, it, it, it is, I mean, uh, the designers will say it's not a direct replacement for Sun Misc Unsafe, but much of what the, the, the value of it is, is a replacement for Sun Misc Unsafe. No, no, you, you, can, you can certainly create a sealed class that has a list of permitted subclasses, but you don't have to have those subclasses exist. So it, it, there isn't a matching thing where you have to have them. It's just saying that they can be there and they will be accepted as subclasses if they exist, but it, it isn't a requirement to implement all of them. Um, so you could list as many classes as you want, but you don't have to implement them all at that time. Yes, you could do it that way. Yes. Okay, so I think I've run out of time, so thank you very much.